This podcast is brought to you by the School of Advanced Study, University of London. I think uh, it's time to turn our attention to, um, and I'm hesitant to say this, to do some historical geography. Um, the reason I'm hesitant to say this is because uh, it's a great pleasure to introduce Professor Richard Dennis, um, who has worked on so many different things um, uh, that I don't really have any idea how to summarize it in less than an hour. Um, urban historical geographer, would, would that be a... That's the easiest thing. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Let's just call it that. Um, Richard uh, 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 was based at UCL. I think you're technically retired now. I'm technically retired. In, in, that, way, in that way that eminent professors uh, are never really retired, they just get busier. Um, mm. <laughs> um, <laughs> I think your, your, your profile page at UCL lists over 100 publications since 1975, so um, uh, a, a wide-ranging uh, set of ideas uh, that Richard's worked on, from morality to social history to um, the, the, uh, the, the fabric of London's buildings uh, in the late 19th and early 20th century. Um, and today you're going to focus on a, on a very particular uh, aspect of your work, um, which we're really interested to hear about. Uh, and uh, Richard's paper is called Walking to Work, George Gisson and Charles Booth on the Streets of Victorian London. Yeah, thank you, Ryan. Um, this is the worst kind of paper. In that I've written it far too late and therefore it's far too long. So you'll see at certain points in this presentation I'll suddenly scoot through about, about five slides which I won't have time to talk about. But rather like passage, my title has multiple meanings. I'm not actually talking today about walking from home to a place of work, from Gissing's garret to the rooms that he occasionally hired down the street in order to get a quiet place to do some writing. And I don't know about Charles Booth's uh, journey to work, although I imagine from the kind of guy he was that he probably did walk um, to work to his office. Um, uh, rather, I'm talking about authors whose walking is, in a sense, their work, or at least it constitutes the research on which their work is based. And in the case of Charles Booth, uh, the late 19th century initiator of the life and labour of the people of London. I'm using his name as a shorthand for Booth and his colleagues, because in practice most of the walking that I'm going to be talking about uh, was undertaken by George Duckworth in uh, compiling the so-called police notebooks, the revisions uh, that are very easily accessible online not actually through Senate House, but through the LSE. Um, in the case of Gissing, and here's Gissing in his walking gear, um, walking plays numerous roles. Firstly, he thought while he walked. And in the late 1870s and early 1880s, as an impoverished Londoner, he did an awful lot of walking. Uh, reading the letters that he wrote, especially uh, to his brother Algernon, who was still up in the north of England. Uh, we learn, for example, uh, that he walked every morning from seven till eight, pondering the chapter of the day which I write from nine to two. I find that I always invent best in walking, solvitur ambulando. And then he had a very good friend, um, Bertz, a German friend, who moved to Tottenham while Gissing was still living in central London. And he walked to, Bert to visit Bertz two nights of the week, six miles there, six miles back. Sometimes he called the train back. But he says, the two evening walks are precious to me. It is on the walk out and back that most of my happy ideas come to me. If I'm puzzling long about some knotty point, I generally conclude by putting it off to one of those evenings, when I'm sure to have the matter settled, ambulando. But beyond this general walking as a space for thinking, we can see at least two kinds of walking. The walking that Gissing himself undertook, 
to gather information and experience which then found its way into his novels and the walking that he made his characters undertake in the novels themselves. Now the first kind might be deliberate, deliberately going to visit a neighbourhood that he wanted to incorporate into a narrative to ensure that he got his kind of facts right as a good social realist novelist. Or it might be more casual. For many places that Gissing introduced into his novels, we can find entries in his diary or his letters indicating that he'd walked there for pleasure or he'd visited friends or he'd taken lodgings there. And at some stage, Gissing had lodgings almost everywhere in London. Um, or he tutored pupils who lived there. And tutoring was another essential source of income for a novelist who wasn't earning much money, actually, uh, from his books, uh, even, really, when he became a, a fairly successful uh, novelist. And the tutoring involved lengthy walks across London. In February 1881, for example, he complained that he spent no less than four hours every day in travelling backwards and forward between his Islington lodgings and his pupils, most of whom, unsurprisingly, lived in the West End. And in winter, walking even incurred a real cost. You know, everything is covered with slush and mud. I spoil a suit of clothes every day. My very hat is so sprinkled with dirt, it's hardly decent to appear in it. Sometimes he would take these walks and they'd be a complete waste of time. Uh, he had a, one student, um, a guy called Mercier, who was clerk at hospital uh, and lived in Leicester Square. Now, at this stage, Gissing was living in Bloomsbury, so it wasn't a hugely long walk, but he'd walk there early in the morning, turn up and be told, oh, I'm sorry, Mr Mercier is too busy to have a lesson today. Go home. And uh, he recalls one week when this happened, uh, uh, I think, six mornings in succession. <laughs> But then there were the walks that his characters undertake, sometimes paralleling his own walks. In August 1879, for example, he reports going by train to Richmond, walking through the park past the Star and Garter pub. And the following year, Gissing and his wife uh, had a holiday in Hastings. And in the unclassed, uh, his second published novel, written in the early 1880s, there are excursions both to Richmond and past the Star and Garter pub and to Hastings. That's a very kind of mundane kind of introduction of a topographical detail. Sometimes there were more profound walks of self-discovery, as I'll, I'll discuss in a moment. And then there's a third kind of walking, that Gissing commands his readers to do, at least in spirit. Uh, famously, his first published novel, uh, Workers in the Dawn, begins with the injunction, walk with me, reader, into Whitecross Street. And that's his way of taking us into a market street in uh, mid 19th century London on a Saturday night and through the market street to the slum where he wants us to end up, where his character uh, is living. Uh, several years later, in another of his slum novels, uh, Thurza, sorry there's an awful lot of stuff here, but the important bit is in um, bold, we're invited not exactly to walk but now to journey on the top of a tram car along the Caledonian Road. And again, we then get this description which takes us into the area and all the stuff that appears uh, in that long quotation. In the nether world, Gissing tells us, let us follow her. At the very end of the novel, in the last chapter of the novel, uh, James Snowden, the sort of heroine uh, 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 of the novel, is going back to visit uh, in the slums of Clerkenwell. And here there's a very clear contrast in how the reader 
is expected to discover the city? Are they to be provided with a map or a panoramic view? Maybe a lengthy scene-setting description, which you also got in that Caledonian Road uh, passage. Or are they to be led through the area by the author? Michelle Allen, in her book on, on cleansing the city, uh, contrasts the let us follow her scene with a description of Crouch End, which appears in the previous chapter of the same novel, The Netherworld, where we're invited at the outset to look at a map of Greater London, and then we kind of zoom in on this house that um, the family are, are now renting uh, within Crouch End. Riding atop a tram car, in a sense, combines the best of both worlds. It's both a panoramic view, but it's also taking us into the heart of an area. Now, an artistic equivalent may be worth uh, just mentioning here. I expect most people are familiar with William Frith's famous panorama of Paddington, uh, uh, the railway station. Frith's painting is like a novel or maybe a set of interconnected short stories. It's full of incidents and invitations to the viewer to construct their own backstories to what he depicts. But the viewer is still on the outside. We're sitting in the auditorium looking at the action on stage. A much less familiar painting, so much less familiar that all I've managed to get is a rather grotty scan of a, uh, uh, a picture in, uh, in the catalogue. It doesn't seem to exist anywhere or online. Uh, is this painting <coughs> by the uh, Impressionist painter Sidney Starr, um, Paddington, The Arrival Platform. It's painted about 20, 25 years after uh, Frith's uh, painting. But what's happening here is that we're invited to walk into this picture. The train, which you can't see very well in this reproduction, is coming towards us into the platform. You can just see the steam in the background. And we are walking down the platform. Again, there's a series of incidents uh, that we can try and make sense of. What are these people doing, uh, you know, peering down in, in, into this uh, uh, crate with animal in it, or um, uh, the various people you see on the platform that seem to be engaged in conversations, but we're actually walking past them rather than just standing completely on the outside. And this reminds me of uh, Raymond Williams' uh, famous comments about the modernist uh, novel, where he's discussing uh, Virginia Woolf and, and James Joyce, and he comments how the forces of the action have become internal, and in a way there is no longer a city, there is only a man, which seems rather strange when you're writing about Virginia Woolf, but anyway, there is only a man walking through it. The substantial reality, the living variety of the city, is in the walker's mind. The essence of more mundane walking is that we encounter things in a sequence. First this, then that. Which means that later events get interpreted in the light of what we've previously seen. It's only sort of later on that we have the time and the space to reverse the order and make sense of the earlier things with the benefit of hindsight. But what I want to argue is that this is also true of Booth's poverty survey, especially in the revised version that most of us encounter through the uh, so-called police notebooks uh, made in the late 1890s, where they're updating the original map that has been made roughly 10 years earlier, uh, and where mostly George Duckworth is walking the streets in the company of local police officers. So there are two kinds of retrospection that inform that Rivoni survey. There's a long-term comparison with what this street was like 10 years ago, 
So all the little notations that say, was purple, now light blue, was yellow, now red, or less often, a street that has improved over time, uh, usually because of, of slum clearance or the building of model dwellings, you know, was dark blue, now purple. But then there's also the immediate comparison of this street with the previous street that has just been visited a few minutes earlier. Let me give you some examples of this. Um, this is Clerkenwell, uh, and I'm particularly interested, I've got to try and find it myself now, <laughs> on this map. Uh, Aylesbury Street is the street running that way. You can see a black mark up there and a pretty blackish mark down here. These are the, uh, the first edition uh, map and then the, uh, the LSE 1899 version. Um, Bishop's Court, we're told, is one of the worst spots on the subdivision, just underneath where it's un 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 underlined. And then a bit lower down it says, Allen Street and Little Sul Sutton Street would have come here naturally when they were displaced. So the implication is that we already know all about Allen Street and Little Sutton Street. Allen Street and Little Sutton Street are over here. Here's Allen Street, here's Little Sutton Street. And you can see in 1889, there's a big black splodge there. And a lot of this has disappeared and is just kind of a nothing um, uh, 10 years later. So there's been a slum clearance campaign gone here. And the implication is, although it's all guesswork when you read the details of this description, that the people have moved from there over here. And you can then, of course, go back to Allen Street and Little Sutton Street and see the descriptions uh, that are provided uh, 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 of those places too. I think of it as a bit like the sort of subjectivity that's involved in marking exams. You read a succession of absolutely dire answers and at last you encounter one that is sort of half decent. There's a great temptation to say, oh, better give this first. You know, even though it's actually not really all that good, but it's the experience of what you've been marking. I'm sorry if this depresses people who think that marking is a wonderfully objective exercise. Um, it can, of course, <laughs> work uh, the other way around. But that's what is effectively going on in these kind of perambulations uh, through neighbourhoods. Hence, the host of streets that are all the worst street in London, meaning, of course, the worst street that I've visited uh, so far. Uh, if um, Bishop's Court was one of the worst spots on subdivision, then Dorset Street was the worst street in respect of poverty, misery, vice of the whole of London. And then the Daily Mail picked up on that a couple of years later and had a banner headline, The Worst Street in London! <laughs> but the Daily Mail hasn't changed at all. Um, I then came across, um, and this I've only looked up in the last day or two, um, Notting Dale. Uh, partly because there was the uh, television programme two or three years ago uh, that was using the booth and notebooks. And that, they focused on Portland Street. And they said, oh, that was the worst street in London. And I thought, that sounds highly unlikely. <laughs> um, you know, OK, it was on the edge of this really grotty area. And it's one of those areas that people would often refer to as being pretty bad. What I'm intrigued by is actually when you look at the police notebooks, you find that there is a direct comparison between Nottingdale and Dorset Street. Um, first of all, one of the wonderful things in this police notebook is that you get a little map. So they actually draw their own uh, map through the area, telling you about uh, Bangor Street and uh, Kenilworth Street uh, and so forth. <laughs> but then you get um, uh, this description where it says, um, 
having first of all talked about Bangor Street in the first half, then says, as compared with Dorset Street, they have this in their favour. And it actually makes that direct comparison. Now, of course, what you then check back on is the dates at which they visited Dorset Street and the dates at which they visited Bangor Street. And it works very nicely. They've gone to Dorset Street just in November 1898. They were going to Notting Dale pretty early on uh, the following year. So it was still sort of fresh in memory. Uh, and so in this case, you get a rather longer distance comparison of places. Uh, mostly you're getting a comparison which is within a district, comparing one street with the street that we were in five minutes ago. Uh, what a lot of these snippets show is that walking is a mode of research which especially for male walkers tends to be impersonal and observational. Ellen Ross made this nice comment uh, in a piece a few years ago about urban poverty when heard appears less exotic and dangerous than when it is seen more human, familiar and pathetic. And she was talking about lady visitors and social workers who were going into the slums uh, of uh, inner London and coming out with very human stories most of the male observers just walk the streets and say, bloody hell, this is awful, um, and, and wrote it down without any real human uh, engagement. And maybe this is where Booth is different from, say, Mayhew a generation earlier. Mayhew talks to costermongers and crossing sweepers uh, and so on. Booth and his assistants mostly talk to people in authority, clergy, factory owners, social workers, policemen, and of course in the original survey, uh, to school board officers. But they don't often talk to ordinary people in the street. Rather they observe whether they look clean or dirty, respectable or disreputable, whether the streets are clean or full of rubbish, especially food waste whether the dwellings look neat and tidy or dilapidated with dirty or cracked windows. And especially, they judge a street by whether the front doors are open or closed. All doors open is a sort of mantra that runs through the slum streets of the whole of, of inner London. And I've got a few examples here, a couple here from Bloomsbury, uh, Gow Little Gower Place, um, now part of UCL, um, <laughs> uh, uh, which has, um, you know, doors open, bread and vegetables lying about. Um, Branton Place, which is now where Flaxman Terrace is, uh, a bit further to the east. Irish thieves overcrowding, all doors open, windows patched and dirty, women sitting on doorsteps. Uh, only very occasionally do you come across the opposite. So here's a, a, a street in the East End, uh, Richard Street, um, all doors shut. And the consequence of seeing that all the doors are shut is that you upgrade Richard Street from having been light blue to being purple. It's gone up in the world during uh, the course of, uh, of the 1890s. And the last example here of all doors open uh, is Chadwick Street um, in Westminster. Um, Westminster Abbey is just off the, uh, the, the map in the sort of top up, up where the sign saying groups of vulgar flat sat slatternly women. Um, and I choose this example because this brings me back to Gissing. Because all doors open finds a kind of, I don't know, what's the opposite of an echo, a sort of pre-echo, um, in, in Gissing's early novel that I've already mentioned, The Unclassed, published in 1884. Uh, Gissing sets this partly in the slums of Westminster uh, that he makes up a name for, in this case, as Litany Lane. And we're told that 
Litany Lane was a narrow passage, blah, blah, blah. It's clearly not intended for the public to sort of drive through. It's strangers keep out. Um, there were two or three dirty little shops, but the rest were ordinary lodging houses, the front doors standing wide open as a matter of course. Um, this is Gissing in topographic mode, as if he was a Charles Booth investigator ten years before uh, Charles Booth was investigating. For Gissing's earliest books, we have little evidence that he paid deliberate visits to particular locations, as he clearly did later on uh, for the novel Thurza uh, and for the Nether World. Uh, in the case of Thurza, we have letters to family and friends recording that he'd been walking the streets of Lambeth doing research. And the book then bears testimony in the number of very specific walks that you can reconstruct and the very specific places uh, like Paradise Street and Walnut Tree Walk and Brook Street uh, and Newport Street that he refers to uh, frequently uh, through the course of the novel. For the netherworld, he went and visited political meetings and factories in Clerkenwell, uh, that kind of thing. But other parts of these novels simply draw on his regular own experience. In the netherworld, the Bias family live in Hanover Street uh, on the sort of margins of poverty in Islington, backing onto the canal. And Gissing had lived himself there uh, for a couple of years um, in, in about 1880. In Thurza, the action actually starts in the Lake District in Pooley Bridge and Ullswater and it ends in Eastbourne, both places that Gissing had visited <coughs> on, on holiday uh, during the late 1870s and the early 1880s. Walking the streets could walk, work sort of both ways. It could also deter you from including the experience in a novel. If you walked into an area and you thought, I haven't a clue what's going on here, I really don't understand it. Um, in February 1883, Gissing wrote to his sister, I spent an evening in the East End on Saturday. It's a strange neighbourhood, totally different from the parts of London in which my walks generally lie. The faces of the people are of an altogether different type, etc, uh, etc. <coughs> Now, what's interesting about that is that Gissing very rarely set his novels in the East End. He didn't feel confident about writing about what we would think of as the East End, Whitechapel, um, uh, Tower Hamlets, that, that, that kind of area. He felt much more comfortable writing about back streets on the margins of poverty farther west because these were the places where he lived himself. And the unclassed is a case in point. He was writing this novel at the time that he made this particular excursion, but he chose not to go there in the three-volume edition of the book that was published in 1884, where the places that are marked in red on this map are the places that get mentioned in uh, the first edition uh, of the unclassed. The only time when he ventures outside uh, the East End in that novel is when one of the characters, a character called Slimy, um, who lives in Litany Lane, mugs the rent collector, Osmond Waymark, makes off with the money and drinks himself to death and is then found in a garret in Limehouse. And the whole point of that is that Limehouse is so far away, it's off this version of the map, it's, it, it's on that version, right? It's so far away that, that Slimy won't be known in Limehouse. He goes there deliberately 
to sort of end it all because he's had enough and, uh, um, and nobody's going to find him and rescue him there because it's in the East End which is too far out of the uh, area in which most of the novel and most of London as far as Gissing is concerned uh, takes place. Now, of course what is fascinating about all of this is that the version of the unclassed that most people read nowadays is the version that came out in 1895 when Gissing was asked to revise the novel because he'd started to be a bit more popular. He had a new publisher. The publisher said, oh, these old three-volume novels are dead. Can you turn it into a one-volume novel? So he had to cut out lots of stuff and he gets rid of lots of sort of, actually a lot of topographical detail and a lot of philosophising. And what he's left with is a novel where he then thinks, oh, I'd better update it. I'd better change all the locations that I mentioned in 1880 to locations that are more popular in the mid-1890s. <laughs> so he actually just makes the sort of random decision to move the slum from Westminster to a rather vaguely stated East End without, of course, changing the dress or the speech or any of the other things of the characters that he'd said was so important uh, when he was uh, uh, visiting the East End uh, 12 years earlier. Now, there are interesting reasons also as to how he, he makes these revisions, and I haven't got time uh, to go into those now. What I want to finish with, I'm conscious I've already gone on a bit too long, um, is to look at a couple of walks on which Gissing sends his characters in his first two novels, and which seem to me to be in the sort of lineage that takes us from Poe's Man in the Street and Dickens' Night Walks through to Virginia Woolf's uh, Mrs Dalloway. This kind of modernist engagement that we get through walking the streets. So, in Workers in the Dawn, Gissing's first novel, Arthur and his employer, Samuel Tolliday, take regular Sunday afternoon walks from over here in Charlotte Place, where they have a printer's shop. Uh, and on this particular Sunday, they walk eastward to Whitecross Street, which is where Arthur had grown up. The western part of this route is left unspecified. Merely, they set off citywards. But it actually turns into a sort of intriguing mirror image, seems to me, of Oliver Twist's early morning expedition with Bill Sykes, which starts in the East End and, and of course, ends up right out in far west London robbing somebody's house, um, uh, but does go through places like Smithfield uh, in some detail. Gissing's version is in the reverse direction. And in the mid-1860s, when this walk is set, the old live meat market, which Oliver had experienced, this open-air market, had been closed for a decade. The date of Arthur and Tolliday's walk isn't specified, but it seems likely to have been before 1868, uh, which is when the new market buildings uh, were erected. So basically we've got an empty space, or possibly a building site, and they're going there on a Sunday afternoon, so it really is a kind of tabula rasa. There's nobody much else there. There's nothing going on. It makes a perfect location in which Tolliday, who is one of these kind of sort of uh, radical spokespeople, can deliver his version of English history. Um, then they move on through Little Britain, which at that stage would have been a kind of labyrinth of uh, this kind of a uh, building from photographs that were taken in, in, in the 1870s. And they get to Whitecross Street. And Whitecross Street um, offers Gissing 
and Arthur the opportunity to reprise the story so far, which is very necessary because this is a 700 page novel, so there's so many characters and incidents you've kind of lost track of what's going on uh, by this stage in, in, in the book. Uh, so we get a kind of, here is a, a quick summary of what's happened so far as Arthur tells his story to Tolliday. Um, but for Tolliday, Whitecross Street signifies the debtor's prison. And for Tolliday, debt is to prove fatal. He dies of a heart attack a few chapters later when his home and his shop are threatened with repossession because he hasn't repaid uh, a, a, a debt. Now, of course, what this is telling us is that we've got this kind of mixture of topographical detail, but also very deliberately chosen uh, to further the plot, and also a kind of illustration of intertextuality, as Gissing is sort of jousting uh, with Dickens, who had been uh, previously his great hero. In revisions to this novel that Gissing started to sketch but never finished, the whole of the content of the walk is deleted. Instead, they just start walking citywards, and then we learn they kept on till they reached the high street of Whitechapel, where Tolliday tells Arthur that he ought to be like Hogarth, and because he is a, a budding painter. And of course, Hogarth is the expert observer of street life. I want to come to this uh, last couple of examples, which is from the unclassed, where again we have two walks uh, which Gissing sends his characters on. One by Maud, who walks from Paddington, St Mary's Terrace, where she's living at this stage in the novel, all the way down to Litany Lane. Uh, and the other, uh, actually earlier in the novel, uh, by Waymark, who walks from Wolfcott Square in Kennington up to South Bank, uh, uh, Lytham Grove area now, um, where um, uh, Maud was at that stage uh, living. Both of these walks, for the most part, are excised in the 1895 edition, but in the 1884 edition they are told in some quite loving detail. Uh, which again I haven't got time to go into now. Uh, the real sort of put down is that in 1895, uh, Maud, instead of walking all the way down, visiting prostitutes around Piccadilly Circus, being rescued by a policeman around Trafalgar Square, in 1895 she gets to Oxford Street, she gets on a bus, and one sentence later she gets off at Litany Lane. You know. But much the same happens uh, in Waymark's Walk. In 1895, he just starts walking and thinks, where shall I go? Oh, I'll go to South Bank. I know that. There's someone I know who lives there. In 1884, he pauses on Westminster Bridge, looks over the bridge. He pauses in St James's Park. He has his lunch in a restaurant in Tottenham Court Road. And then he has this wonderful passage, or, um, really wildly over the top, but a kind of... Zimmel-esque uh, riff on what the uh, futility and anonymity of London life is all about. You know, again amid the crowd. Um, what in the name of sense and reason did it mean? This hustling and bustling of the people on all sides, the sweating millions, blah, blah, blah. Our friend walked on regarding all he passed with a good-humoured pity. And it's only at that point that he decides to go and visit the woman who's going to be his girlfriend, or one of his girlfriends, um, in, in um, uh, South Bank. Let's get to the end. Um, <coughs> I, I shouldn't have gone quite that quickly. <laughs> um, Gissing's walks take us across social and neighbourhood boundaries. They're transects through London, or they're about different characters experiencing the walk differently. In contrast, it seems to me, Booth's walks are about consensus. 
policemen and social investigators agreeing on how to classify a street. And they're mostly intricately traced within neighbourhoods rather than across them. At the other extreme of specificity, Gissing also enters into the room, whereas for Booth, the buildings are a kind of facade. You observe the outside of the building, but you don't often go inside. What conclusion have I got from all this? Not a lot. Uh, but there are clearly always more streets to explore. There are poverty surveys are like painting the fourth bridge. As soon as you finish one, you have to start all over again. Um, in novels, we have to recognise the dialogue between the walk and the plot, uh, which is perhaps why Gissing eliminates these walks from uh, the later versions of his novels, because they don't really serve the plot. And we have to recognise the intertextuality of the topography. But that, of course, is true also of social investigations, maybe less self-consciously, but Booth is writing in the context of other people uh, as well. But I hope I've said enough, too much, to demonstrate a range of sources for exploring the streets of Victorian London, whether in social surveys, fiction, diary entries or letters, and to indicate the range of experiences, perceptions, representations that they can offer. But I suspect that, far from curing your headache, I've probably only made it worse. Thank you. Thank you very much.